Yeah, we finished learning unit six. We didn't actually do anything in relation to learning unit seven. That's when we started doing our revision. So uh, I think let me quickly get through the slides for learning unit um, seven, and then we will uh, do one or two exercises before the end of the day. Um, and then, yeah, we'll call it a day. So for homework, I want you guys to do I want you guys to do um, revision exercise three. I want you guys to do revision exercise three. Yeah, for learning unit seven. Three. Yeah, okay. Right. So, Right, so learning unit uh, seven is on introducing sampling distributions, okay? So you'll see that um, a lot of this unit is actually quite uh, familiar to what we actually had done, okay? Uh, here are the learning outcomes, okay? Describe the purpose and concept of sampling distributions. Define the concept of sampling error and calculate its value. Explain how the sampling distribution of the mean is created and the shape and parameters of the distribution. Distinguish between different sampling distributions using the central limit theorem where Appropriate. Then calculate and interpret the probabilities using the sampling distribution of the mean. And then calculate and interpret the probabilities associated with a sample. Okay. Now, before I go any further, okay, we are just going to brush through these slides. But at the end of the day, remember, we get a sample from a population. All right, and why we get a sample is because we want to typically infer, to say, okay, ah, lecturers think varsity college students or IIE students don't study. Okay, so what will we do if we want to verify that statistically? What are we going to do? We're going to take a few students and then maybe run a survey. We can use different methods, <clears throat> uh, do an analysis or maybe study hours and then compared to the study hours that should be undergone in order to pass them on to ETC, ETC. There's different ways we can do it. But that sample, when we run our experiments, our statistical methods on it, should then, be, we should be able to infer to the population, okay? So that's what we're pretty much talking about here. So the results that we get from the sample should match the results that we would get from the population, okay? So if we do have an average for the population, we can compare that with the average of the sample. And the closer they are, the better. Okay, All right. So that's what we are basically talking about here. So here, now sampling and sampling methods, okay? I spoke to inference, all right? We want to infer our results from the sample to that of the population, okay? Right. The following are the four pillars that support the inferential analysis. And without them, inferential statistics are neither feasible nor valid. Okay? Descriptive statistics, we did this in learning unit three. The mean, in other words, the average, proportions, and standard deviation. Okay? Standard deviation, we're saying, how far away are our results from the average? Okay? Just to recap. Probabilities, essentially the especially, sorry, the normal probability distribution. That's that bell-shaped curve. Whenever you see normal uh, probability distribution, bell-shaped curve is what they're talking about there. Then sampling means, okay, maybe just before I go there, remember we always say that data 
is normally distributed. That's an assumption we make. We assume that it is normally distributed. Most of the results are close to the mean. We know the mean is in the center of that bell, isn't it? Okay. Then sampling methods um, and their influence on sampling error. Okay. When we're talking sampling methods, there's different ways that we can pull that group of varsity college students. We can say, we're going to take five first years, we're going to take five uh, second years, and then we're going to take five third years across different programs. Or we can just say, we're going to just pick at random when we get onto campus, okay? We're going to discuss those different uh, sampling uh, methods and their advantages and disadvantages, okay? And then lastly, the concept of the sampling distribution, okay? Which we will see more of as we go along. So here, we know that a sample is a subset, all right? It's a portion of the population, nothing new there. A sample must represent the target population, okay? If it doesn't, already we have a problem. Because whatever information we get from there, we cannot infer to the population, okay? Uh, to produce valid and reliable estimates, okay? That's why we want the sample to relate to or be representative of the population. Because then we have valid and reliable estimates of the population from which it is drawn, okay? There are two basic methods of sampling, two basic methods probability sampling and non-probability sampling, okay? Non-probability sampling, all right, is where the sample members are not selected randomly. So I just wake up and say, hey, I, my favorite students in third year are Mang Mang, second year and then first year do the same. That is convenient sampling because I've said who, those students who I like are the ones that are, that are going to participate in this experiment. Can you see that? Um, so there's no randomness when it comes to uh, non-probability. It says where the sample members are not selected randomly, it's called non-probability sampling. Because randomness allows there to be fairness, okay? It means that it's a representation of the population because it's like, if I say based on the people that I like, yes, some of those people belong to the population, but it's not to say that they display the character, characteristics, all the characteristics of people who are, who are uh, within that population, all right? So the data is likely to be biased, okay? So there are four types of non-probability sampling methods. So there's convenience, there's judgment sampling, there's quota, and then there's snowballing. Okay, so you guys, these are things that you guys need to read on and read about just to understand, but they're not complicated. So convenience drawn to suit the convenience of the researcher. It's convenient for me. I know the names of my favorite students, all right? Um, they pass. Uh, we have a relationship. If I ask them to do something for me, they are more than likely to assist, okay? Then judgment sampling, what's happening there? Researcher uses their judgment alone to select the best sampling units to include in the sample okay if i say if the study is based on students don't study then i go and look for students who are not doing well can you see i'm using my judgment to say it's going this is likely to confirm my research or at least give me insights into whether a student uh, study or not here they say example only professional footballers instead of any football player are selected and interviewed on the need for rule changes in sports, right? Only professional footballers, okay? So only professional footballers are being selected. Instead of any football players are selected and interviewed on the need for rule changes in the sport, okay? So can you see me? I'm a football player, but I'm not a professional football player. So you, you see, the reality is, yeah, I might know about the rules of the game, but professional footballers, this is their bread and butter. Does that make sense? So they know these rules inside out, okay? So it makes sense to pick them over 
someone like me who just plays in their spare time. You get what I'm saying? So that's what they mean by judgment. But again, judgment is not random. Can you see that? Okay. Quota. Quota, this is what I was giving an example of when I said we're going to pick five first years, five second years, five third years, and so on and so forth. Okay? Here they say when the quota for any one subgroup is met, no more sampling units are selected from that subgroup. So when I have my five first years, I no longer continue to select first years. That's what they're basically saying there. This introduces selection bias into the sampling process. Okay, this begins to introduce selection bias. Then snowballing, what's going on there? Snowballing is used when it is not easy to identify the members of the target population for reasons of sensitivity and confidentiality. So here, an example, may include studies related to HIV and AIDS. Okay, maybe if it was even, you know, anything where people don't want to come out right and say, this is uh, uh, my situation. It could be, oh, um, you know, some students actually might be performing exceptionally well, but you don't want to put them on the spot in front of the whole class. Does it make sense? So we do things anonymously. Uh, I was doing a quiz the other day with my business management students there at MSA, and what I did in order to ensure that, you know, um, we weren't revealing um, names or anything to that effect, is in doing the quiz, I said, okay, you do the quiz. We're all doing the quiz. But you pass your paper to someone else, they mark it. And when I ask for feedback in terms of how many did you get correct, she's not giving me her mark. She's giving me the mark of the person she marked for. So that shows me roughly how are, is the students understanding the content, okay? Without obviously revealing that, hey, that one there is not understanding anything. Makes sense? Okay, so, all right. There are two major disadvantages, and this is where we're trying to get to, when it comes to non-probability sampling. Uh, the samples are likely to be unrepresentative of their target population, leading to bias into statistical findings. If I go and select students who are not performing to confirm whether students study or not, already you can see the bias that's likely to be found there, okay? Because it's not a true reflection of the population. Not everybody is not studying, isn't it? So obviously, um, you know, we, we, we want to have findings that are valid and reliable. So that's a problem when it comes to non-probability, when we are not selecting at random. Then, it is not possible to measure the sampling error, okay, from the data based on non-probability sampling, okay? Sampling error is when we say, oh, actually the definition is right there. Sampling error is the difference between the actual population, uh, actual population parameter, value or, or specific characteristic, you could say, and it's sample statistic, okay? Remember, we, we get a sample statistics to say how close is our sample to the actual results of our population. So, because we have not selected at random, we cannot use non-probability sampling. We cannot, how do I say this? It's not possible to measure the sampling error as a result because of the fact that it's not, it's uh, participants were not selected at random, okay? And as such, the results, it says, as a result, it is not valid to show, sorry, to draw statistical inference. So I actually said this earlier from the non-probability sampling data, which is a problem because uh, nine times out of 10, we want to be able to infer. But sometimes we can just do this in order to get gauge, get a feel for what is the data telling us, okay? So here's what they're actually saying. However, non-probability sampling can be used to, sorry, in exploratory research situations 
or in less scientific surveys to provide initial insight. Okay, they're just saying what I was saying in a more polished way. Okay, now they speak to probability sampling. Okay, probability sampling includes any selection method where the sample members or sampling units are selected from the target population on a purely random, purely chance basis. Why do we like random sampling? Because everybody within the population has an opportunity to participate in the study. So it gives a fair um, representation of your uh, population because anybody could have been selected. Under random sampling, every member of the target population has a chance of being selected. I swear, these, these slides are, are reading my mind. There are four probability-based sampling methods. Okay, so these are the um, uh, methods. Simple random sampling. Okay, then systematic random sampling. Then stratified random sampling. And then cluster random sampling. So in uh, simple random samples, each member in the target population has an equal chance of being selected. Okay, this is what we've pretty much been talking about. Uh, population is homogeneous. Who knows what homogeneous means? Yeah, Google it, it's fine. What does homogeneous mean? Same. So if we think all of our students are the same, that they're not distinctively different, we can then obviously randomly select anyone. Because we know that if you guys are the same, your feedback, regardless of who we ask, is going to be the same. Does that make sense? So that's when we say the population is homogeneous. The people are the same. Yes? But so is that always the case? No. So you don't always assume that the population is the same? No. And then you would need to use a different sampling technique which would be more appropriate where we have slight differences and speaking to the example that i've been giving in a varsity college setting students are not always we're coming from different backgrounds we're having different experiences we have different levels of privilege if at all right so we can't begin to just look at everyone the same so, so see, yeah this is this yeah, it's the easiest sampling because we're just selecting at random. The other ones, there's a little more work that comes into play, and you'll see it now. Okay. So here, uh, systematic random sampling, what's going on here, is used to sample items from a continuous or batch production process or where a sampling frame exists, okay? So here, systematic, we're basically saying, you know, if we go into a Coca-Cola factory, all right, and we then obviously want to test whether these, uh, the Coke in the bottles is actually meeting the relevant standard. We can't test each and every one of the bottles we produce. That's too much work, isn't it? So what do we do? We then say, okay, every 10th bottle is the one we're going to test. Does that make sense? So can you see that it's systematic? And then we say, okay, from this bottle, we're then going to test every 10th one. So if you go to page 175, you'll see your textbook gives a brilliant example of uh, your systematic random sampling. Um, so I'm just gonna read the third bullet point there. It says, therefore, subsequent sampling units are selected at a uniform interval interval relative to the first sampling unit remember i said from this bottle we're saying every 10. can you see the systematicness in that okay 
right? Okay, but yeah, if you want to make sure you understand that, uh, you can quickly just read through that. And then just to, you can see that there is some randomness involved in that because we are saying every 10, we're not, we're not picking favorites or anything. Yeah. Okay. Then stratified random sampling. This is the third one now. Uh, here it says is used when the population is assumed to be heterogeneous. Now heterogeneous is the opposite of homogeneous, which is what we were now talking about. Where we're saying no, 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 no. Not all the random variables are the same. Not all the students are the same under the study. Okay, uh, heterogeneous. The variables under study are differing in kind. So it's not to say they are completely different, but on some level they are different. The population is divided into segments, also known as strata, or strata, where the population members within each stratum are relatively homogeneous. So we're saying second years are fairly similar. First years are fairly similar. They don't have a cooking clue where they are. They don't know the work ethic needed here. All right. Third years again are different in that they're seasoned. They are tired of us. They want to just leave the campus, isn't it? So can you see now we've actually segmented them? OK, all right. And I know I'm using very simplistic examples because even within that, again, like we mentioned earlier, students are not the same. OK, but I'm just trying to drive the point. Okay. Then here it says, therefore, simple random samples are drawn from each segment. So again, you can see there's an element still of randomness. And this is why it is a probability uh, theory. Was that the last one? OK, it wasn't. OK, now here they are talking to the advantages and disadvantages of that particular method. But I don't want to go into that because I don't want us to dwell too much on this. OK, here the whole focus is that we have non-probability and probability sampling and we have different types within those two main forms of sampling so cluster random sampling okay contain uh, sorry certain target populations form natural clusters okay which make for easier sampling e.g labor force uh, labor forces cluster within factories accountants cluster within accounting firms etc okay cluster random sampling is used where the target population can be naturally divided into clusters where each cluster is similar in profile to every other cluster a subset of a cluster or sorry a subset of clusters in them randomly selected for sampling. A subset of clusters, I think, is then randomly selected for sampling. Okay. So when we have, let's say we are looking at professionals, okay. So obviously, you know, the feedback we're going to get from plumbers is not the same as we're going to get from factory workers, it's not the same as we're going to get from accountants and um, C-suite execs and so on and so forth. So we then are going to, much like the strata, we're then going to collect or get a subset of each of those clusters. Okay. Um, so here, what are they saying? The sampling units within these sample clusters may themselves be randomly selected to provide a representative sample from the population. Thus, it is also called two-stage cluster sampling. Cluster sampling tends to be used when the population is large and geographically dispersed. Would have been nice if they gave, oh, there is an example there. So here, an example could be each of the 25 major shopping malls in the uh, Cape Peninsula can be classified as a cluster, each of the 25 major malls. Okay, so we've got 25, and they're based in different geographic locations. 
within this area or region. A researcher may randomly choose seven of these shopping malls and randomly select customers within each of these selected clusters. So we're basically saying those 25, the entire population, will fall within seven provinces, for example, or for argument's sake. And then obviously, now we'll just select a subset of customers from each of those seven provinces. Okay, where are we now? Uh, interview, e.g. on clothing, purchasing, behavior patterns. Their responses are assumed to reflect the views of all shopping malls. All right, all shopping malls, shoppers. <laughs> nice word play there. Within, obviously, your Cape Peninsula. All right, I hope that makes sense. Okay, again, advantages and disadvantages. Here's a nice summary of your sampling methods. Again, this is the key thing. These are just explanatory descriptive uh, statistics only. They just explain some insights. Whereas probability sampling, descriptive statistics that we can then infer to the population. Right. Okay. So now this is where we start to look into some of the stuff that we're actually interested in in learning unit seven earlier i mentioned that the statistics of the sample are compared with the statistics of the population all right that's the relationship when we're talking about sampling distribution okay the sample statistic varies about its true population parameter this is how it should be the sample should be around the population parameter. Then here, level of confidence. We're saying, how confident are we in our, in our estimations? Okay. So when we are talking level of confidence here, they're saying the level of confidence is the estimating, yeah, sorry, the level of confidence in estimating the population parameter from a single sample statistic can be established from this relationship. Usually, um, if you guys were doing some statistical work, they would tell you the level of confidence that they want you to do this exercise or analysis on. An important statistical question in inferential statistics is how reliable and precise is the sample statistic as a true and representative measure of its population? This is why we look at the level of confidence, so that we can say how confident are we that our results are precise and reliable. Okay. The aim is to establish how close the sample statistic lies to the population parameter. Okay. So you see, we keep revisiting that point. And here you can see the symbols. The average for the population is that crazy looking U. And the average for the sample is that X with a dash on top. Okay, so these are the things that you guys will be playing around. Okay. Right. So I wouldn't worry about that just yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Rational of sample distributions. As we know, N is the total number of potential outcomes, okay? And then K is your samples. Ah, again, this is stuff we will make sense of when we do it together. We want to know the standard deviation of our, of our sample, okay? We want to know the mean of our sample. So here, they start getting into examples. All right, histogram and so on and so forth. All right, the sample mean is a random variable that has the following three uh, properties. This is important. Okay, so your sample mean, okay, has the following three properties. Okay, it is normally distributed. Uh, a mean 
it has a mean, the sample has a mean that is equal to the population mean. Okay? These are the properties, okay? It has a standard deviation called the standard error equal to, okay, we'll see this being applied, okay? Based on the above three properties and using normal probability distribution theory, the following is the conclusion about how sample means behave in relation to their population, okay? You're gonna, I'm gonna show you this graphically, okay? But this is very, very important, okay? This is what we are talking about when it comes to uh, continuous distribution. These formulas we're going to be applying, these are the two formulas that we're going to be applying in learning unit seven. All right, so we're going through all of this theory so that we can understand these two formulas or how to apply them. So here we're looking for the average and, uh, oh, sorry, for X, X is going to be the difference between your sample mean and your population mean divided by the standard deviation of your sample. And then here, we're now looking at your uh, population, okay? And quite similar, we're looking at your sample population minus your, uh, sorry, your sample, yes, your sample population uh, uh, minus the actual population, and then obviously standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of variables in that particular stack, okay, or sample. Right, so this is what I was saying, I'm going to show you graphically. So here you can see, we are basically saying that the variables within our study, any study that we do statistically, we're already assuming normal distribution, isn't it? But we're saying the sta um, our variables, our random variables, 68.3% of those variables fall within one standard deviation, one plus or minus standard deviation away from the mean. Remember, this is the mean, okay? This is your central limit, okay? Then we go on to say 95.5% of all your variables will fall between two standard deviations, positive or negative, from your mean. Okay, so we're looking at this to this. Then we're saying 99.7% of all your potential variables in your study are going to fall within three standard deviations, plus or minus, away from the the mean. Okay, those were the, the, the three uh, bullet points that were highlighted in purple. That is what they were trying to read. I think it makes more sense visually than obviously just reading it and then you're like, so, okay? Right. So the whole point there is that most of your variables within your study are not too far away from your average. Remember, we always say the mean is your average. Is the fancy word for your average, okay? This relationship between the sample mean and its population mean can be used to find probabilities the, that a single sample mean will lie within a specific distance of its true but unknown population mean. Okay, so this allows us to make certain assumptions. Okay, um, and this is remember probability is likelihoods. That's what we're saying. What is the likelihood of this, that, and the third? Okay? And therefore, if we say all data is normally distributed, we can begin to say, okay, so it should be within the average. So this is the probability of this answer being X. Okay? Calculate probability based 
uh, interval estimates of the population. Okay. Then finally, test claims and statistical hypothesis about a value for the true but unknown population mean. You're going to see this in learning unit eight, the very next learning unit. Okay. The sampling distribution is the is the base. Sorry, the sampling distribution is the base for the two inferential techniques of confidence intervals and hypothesis tests yet to be covered. Okay. I told you guys the slides that are reading my mind. Okay. Um, so here now. Sampling distribution of the sample portion. Okay. Um, I don't think we need to go through this. This is just some good good knowledge to have, but I don't think it's entirely relevant. Let's quickly see. Yeah, they're just repeating, giving examples. Here's the other calculation that you need to know that we are going to be utilizing when we are question is based on population. Your questions in learning unit uh, seven are either going to be in relation to the mean or are going to be in relation to the population. Okay. All right. Uh, and then here they are going back again to what we just explained. Okay. So it, it also applies to population. Earlier we were talking about the mean, same principle when it comes to population. All right. 68.3% of our variables are going to be within one standard deviation, positive or negative, from the population of the uh, bigger population, or um, for lack of a better term, okay, and so on and so forth, okay. And then here now they're just talking to central limits. Uh, I think the only key thing to highlight here is just from a statistical standpoint, maybe the last two bullet points. The third, particularly uh, you guys are either doing research or going to do research, so just so you are aware. If the underlying population from which a sample is drawn is not normally distributed, all right, or its distribution is unknown, then, as a proven, as proven by the central limit theorem, provided that the sample size is large enough, usually n, all right, in other words, the total population is greater than 30, the sampling distribution of the mean or, or proportion can be assumed to be normally distributed or normal. All right, the distribution can be assumed to be normal. The whole point of why I shared that is, remember when we say something is normally distributed, we are saying it assumes the bell-shaped curve, okay? So again, when you guys are doing research, you want it to follow the bell-shaped curve, okay? So you'll find that a lot of your studies when doing research, they will ask you to use at least 30 um what's this respondents if you're doing a survey okay um so at least have 30 variables under your study so that we can then see okay cool uh, we can make inferences of this because your study is normally distributed okay then the last one they're saying the central limit uh central limit theorem states that Regardless of the shape of the underlying population from which the sample is drawn, as the sample size n increases, the sampling distribution of the mean or the uh, proportion approaches a normal distribution. So the, this is why you try and get as many people as possible in your study. And then here is just uh, an example of... Um, different distributions and so on. But again, that's not entirely important. Okay, so I think from a theoretical standpoint, that's what's happening in learning unit 
seven. So let us take our break. And then when we get back, we will then go into some exercise questions. Right. 